First of all, Kevin, you're exactly right, except gold is not a commodity. It's money. Okay. So, Jim, from your point of view, what, what can... Uh, what should happen that uh, gold will win back its mojo and 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 uh, actually tra trade higher again? W from your point of view, what what has to happen? Well, um, it, I'm always fascinated when astute and attentive analysts look at a subject and come out in the same place through completely different paths. So when Kevin, you know, did his summation and said, I think it's a good buying opportunity. I agree completely. I agree with Kevin. I, I, would, I would say the same thing. Uh, but I disagree a little bit with some of his descriptions. So if I can just drop a few footnotes. Um, Kevin said that, you know, talked about the peak in uh, August, August 6th, 2020. It was the all-time high for gold, about 2,069 U.S. dollars per ounce. And he, he said, his quote was, straight down since then. Well, if you take August 6th, 2020 and uh, October 7th, 2021, down is down, no, no question about it. But it's not straight down. This has been one of the okay. most fa fascinating, no, one of the most fascinating roller coasters. We had three smashes. We had a 4% smash in, uh, when I say smash, uh, an air pocket. It goes down like in 24 hours, 48 hours at the most. We had a 4% smash in uh, June, uh, June 16th, 2021, when the Fed first said, hey, we're going to taper. They've been dialing up the, uh, the messaging since then. But that was the first time that any Fed um, release uh, you know, referred to a taper you know, sooner than later. We had a 9% smash on August 8th, 2021. Uh, on a Sunday night when Shanghai, London, and New York physical markets were all closed, this was executed, clearly a manipulation of some sort. You know, we don't know the culprit. Uh, I suspect the Russians, but, uh, but who knows, right? Um, down 9% high to low. I can't even say intraday because it was like 8 o'clock on a Sunday night. Um, but that was... Um, Uh, again, not, yeah, uh, the, the, it was executed through the futures markets and the, the physical equivalent of the futures sold were 50 metric tons. And everyone on this call, and I assume most of our listeners knows that 50 metric tons is a lot of gold for, for anybody. You can't buy it. I mean, call JP Morgan and say, you know, offer me 50 metric tons, they'll hang up the phone, but, but you can do it in the futures market and that's what happened. And then another um, smash it began about four uh, percent a couple of weeks ago. I don't have the exact date. It was around September 23rd, give or take. Um, so, what gold has actually been doing? It's not straight down, uh, not even close. It is trading in a range. It's a broad range. The central tendency is $1,800 an ounce. The high end of the range is about $1,900 well, $1, an ounce. The low end is $1,700 an ounce. That's, now, it's a big range. That's 11% or 5.5% on either side of the central tendency. If you, look, uh, if you look at a chart, are there a couple peaks where it just kind of got over $1,900? Yeah. Uh, a couple lows, you know, 1678, where it went below $1,700. Yeah. But they were all like a day, a, a day or two, and then it kind of got back in that range. Um, and so what... Uh, so that's important because gold is actually going sideways. It's going sideways around the central tendency of $1,800 an ounce with a lot of volatility, but it's staying in that range. So gold is kind of going nowhere, which is really, really interesting to me because, I, by the way, I don't consider myself a technician. I consider myself a fundamental analyst and a global macro analyst, but I look at charts. I think charts are information rich. Uh, I don't you know, I don't pull out the whole tech, technical bag of tricks and I'm familiar with it. I just, um, it, it, it doesn't have that much value for me, but, but a chart is, a chart does have value. It's very information rich. And so you look at the chart, what's fascinating is not, you know, gold is down over that entire period from the peak. Yeah. But since uh, it kind of, the drawdown was mostly between August 8th, um, 2020 and the end of September 2020. That happened pretty quickly. And then it just got in this range I'm talking about and up and up and down, up and down with, with a lot of volatility in the range. It's it's a paradox. You know, on the one hand, you're kind of going sideways, 
But on the other hand, there's just a lot of vol in the range. So if uh, I'm not a day trader, I recommend gold for portfolios. And I think that's pretty well known. And I recommend a 10% allocation. That's pretty well known. But uh, boy, if you were a day trader and you just bought the dips, you would have made a fortune in this because uh, it has that pattern has persisted for uh, really 14 months at this point. So the question, uh, and just also want to drop a footnote on, on uh, Kevin's point that he said central banks have walked away. Um, that's not true. The, uh, the, there might have been one quarter where central banks were net sellers. Again, I don't question the data at all. You say you're, you're entitled to your opinion, not your own data. So Kevin's right about that. But um, there are far more interesting things going, at, going on in central bank gold accumulation. One of the things I was writing an article about this, you know, so I looked at the, I go to the World Gold Council, they, um, I don't agree with all their analysis, but they get their numbers right, and they're a pretty good source of information. And um, so I was looking at um, Russia, because Russia had been, it was just like clockwork, they were buying, you know, between 10 and 30 tons a month for, for almost 10 years. So it was, you know, they had obviously had standing orders with the dealers, uh, they don't want to disrupt the market. They were they were highly transparent. So, you know, my friend uh, W W Lee and I call her the only central banker who actually knows what she's doing. Uh, was was just like was just like accumulate accumulate, and then it really and then China is the opposite. They've been accumulating, but completely non transparent. I know who their agents are. I know how they do it. But uh, you know, then every five years they say oh, we got we got a thousand tons. Well, really, did you do that overnight, or have you been accumulating for five years and now you decide to tell us? Well, obviously it's the latter. But the Russians are are kind of more interesting because you, you have a lot more information. And um, what the Russians did after ten years of accumulation, they just stopped cold in uh, around January 2021. Uh, and they didn't sell, uh, but they just stopped buying, which is interesting. So I looked at their reserve position and I could see why, because they got gold to almost exactly 20% of their total reserves for, for a round number, um, about 500 billion in reserves of which 100 billion was in physical gold. So about 20%, uh, about 2000, uh, 400 tons, 2,500 tons, you know, give or take. And they said, that's enough. In other words, you, you know, for the same reason I say for an individual portfolio, 10% is, is enough. And then people say, well, Jim, if you think gold's going higher, which I do, uh, why not 50% or 100%? Because that never makes sense. You, you never want to, you can be over allocated. You can't, you can be wrong. Also, you always have to factor that in. But they got to 20% and they just leveled off. They said, okay, we're there. Uh, and if you think about that, it's this is from a sovereign point of view, and this is how Putin thinks. You know, Putin's two favorite sports are, are, are chess and jujitsu, you know, martial arts. So, kind of tells you where he's coming from. So, what they did, and they did it brilliantly, they created the perfect hedge. There's no such thing, but as good as it gets, we'll put it that way. They were, by the way, they've been selling treasuries, reducing their exposure to US dollar instruments. That has more to do with sanctions and possible freezes than it does with asset allocation, but that's a factor. But they still have a large chunk of treasuries. But what do they do? They, they export oil. How is oil priced in dollars? So they've got a big dollar exposure and dollar revenues, dollar inflows, whether they like it or not, because oil is a dollar denominated market. But now they've got a big slug of gold. So one of two things is going to happen. Either the US is going to maintain the value of the dollar uh, and in which case gold will probably kind of continue to go sideways. You won't regret the gold, but you won't be burned on the dollar. Uh, and that'll be a nicely balanced position. But if if the United States manages to get to inflation, we could probably talk more about the inflation deflation debate. I'm, I'm like the last uh, disinflation guy left on the planet. Everyone else is in the inflation Easter camp. Uh, but, but that aside, um, if you believe the U.S. will resort to inflation, which they will eventually, we're just not there yet. This is a timing issue. Then what's going to happen to your dollar assets are going to be worth less, but what's going to happen to your gold? It's going to scream. It's going to go to the moon. So, so there they are. You know, If the dollar is solid, they got a really nice diversified position. And if the dollar, if we resort to inflation, their gold's going to go up and the dollar price of oil is going to go up. So they're, they've got a beautiful hedge. This is like, this is like a, a masterpiece of of uh, hedging uh, and wealth preservation on a going forward basis, which is what a reserve position or sovereign wealth funds, the case may be, is supposed to do. So the Russians have, have handled this uh, in a masterful way. 
But while I'm looking at all this Russian data, something just jumped off the page. And I was like, whoa, because I hadn't you know, followed it. And there it was. Japan has been running at about 600 metric tons for forever. I looked back like 30 years and it hadn't gone up. I suppose you could go back 40, but it was just like the 600 tons. All of a sudden, Japan's position goes up 80 tons, like boom, like almost a 700. And in one month, I said, well, like the Chinese, I know you didn't buy it in one month. The market's, <laughs> market's liquid. It's not that liquid. You can't buy 80 tons. And then I looked into it. What they did, it was an accounting entry where they had the gold in another account. And they did the accounting and moved it over to the reserve position of the Bank of Japan. Uh, and by the way, China does the same thing. They have a sovereign wealth fund, state administration of foreign exchange, one of my next PIMCO guy. Uh, and then they have the People's Bank of China. Everyone looks at the PBOC, but uh, which is, you know, they have a website, but um, safe is non-transparent. So what, when, when you see these big jumps in Chinese gold, it's an accounting entry moving it from safe to the People's Bank of China, but, and then boom, but it's been in safe, in the safe literally uh, all along. Well, Japan did the same thing. Now, I don't know where the gold came from, what, what side account or, um, uh, you know, ledger or whatever inside the, the, uh, the moth, the Ministry of Finance, but they had it and the, and the 50 ton shop shows up. So, so then you have to ask yourself, okay, got it. Why now? Why did they decide to print, um, uh, sorry, I misspoke, I said 50, it was 80. Why did they decide to print an 80 ton increase when they had the gold all along? Why now? Well, you know, uh, look at Afghanistan, uh, look at the US humiliation, look at China on the march, uh, flying 86, uh, you know, uh, their equivalent of an F-35 over Taiwanese airspace, um, the, 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 the AU-KUS uh, deal, giving Australia nuclear powered submarines, uh, the quad getting India. Uh, you know, if you if you if you're Japan, um, suddenly you might have to, you know, become a nuclear power, you might have to go it on your own, go along. And if you're China, you're gonna invade, you're gonna invade Taiwan, why stop there? I mean, if you once you start World War III, you might as well invade Japan. So Japan felt they had to make a statement and they did, but they did it in gold. So uh, is Kevin right about one quarter? Sure, but the, the central banks have not walked away. In fact, if anything, um, by the way, Russia's resumed buying uh, recently. Um, Russia's still in the game. China's in the game in a non-transparent way. Uh, Japan has decided to hoist their gold flag. Turkey's buying gold. The other one, we, don't, we know they're buying, but we don't know how much they're not transparent is Iran. So the central bank uh, acquisition of gold is, is, is still going very strongly. Um, they're still in the game. Um, I also disagree a little bit with the, with the Bitcoin thing. I mean, I, I, uh, actually, uh, as you, Ronnie, I'm sort of getting back on the live circuit. Uh, you know, we all got used to Zoom um, and, or whatever, but uh, I've got some live presentations coming up. So I've been- You're going to, to New Orleans, right? I'm going to New Orleans, yes. uh, right? And then I'm, uh, I was invited to give a, a presentation on, on the cashless society, basically the future money at uh, Hillsdale College. And everyone, you know, I was like, what's Hillsdale College? I said, well, it's the new Harvard. I mean, as, as places like Harvard and Yale have grossly lowered their academic standards, uh, Hillsdale is where all the big brains are going. That's the, I call it the new Harvard. That's where the really... Um, really smart people. So I was actually honored to receive a, a, a guest lecture invitation there. Uh, but so I've been been kind of um, brushing up on this a little bit. But so I, I just do, uh, I just do a ton of work on Bitcoin. I don't know how I got dragged into it, but it was kind of hard, hard to avoid. Um, Bitcoin's interesting in ways that most people don't understand. But uh, the idea that somehow Bitcoin allocations are detracting from what would otherwise be gold allocations yeah maybe a little bit um uh, around the edges but that's that's not a big factor relative to what central banks are doing uh the truth is i'll speak i'll talk about even though in canada i'll talk about americans americans don't get gold we've had you know don't don't understand gold we've had 40 years of uh of, I wouldn't even call it miseducation. We just stopped teaching it in the 70s. You know, if you're, I would say if you're younger than I am and you, you know anything about gold, you're either uh, self-taught or you went to mining college because uh, we, we just stopped teaching it as a monetary asset. Um, but of course it is. But so Americans don't get too um, excited about gold. Uh, yeah, but Americans will buy gold when uh, when the price is, you know, when it's gone from $5,000 an ounce to $7,000 an ounce in, in like six weeks. Be, oh, I got to get some, you know, but, but Kevin's right. The time to get it is right now. 
uh, kind of while you still can in some ways. So, um, so then kind of getting back to your question after that very lengthy digression, but I just wanted to kind of, I just thought it was important to enrich the background a little bit because the central banks are not out of the game. Uh, Bitcoin, I don't think is a big factor and the straight down thing is not straight down. It's, it's down point to point, but uh, with a very interesting pattern along the way. So when you see something that's range bound, which it is, uh, and a central tendency, which is $1,800 an ounce, then the analytic question is, uh, what, what's going to change that? Because it will change and it'll, it'll break. It'll either break up or down. Uh, we don't know exactly when. Um, and uh, my expectation, I think, I guess, I guess what impressed me is that is the floor. Uh, you know, Kevin talked about 2% for inflation. Maybe we can talk more about that, but uh, I, I, I see it as a ceiling. But um, uh, the $1,700 per ounce floor in the range is very significant because to me, it sets up what I call an asymmetric trade. Um, an asymmetric trade is one mm -hmm. where um, it might continue to go sideways, but you're probably, again, probably not going to lose a lot of money if you, and you could make a ton, uh, no pun intended since we're darkening our goal. But the point is, if you've got a floor at 1700 and you've got upside up here, you don't know exactly when you're going to realize the upside, but if you can just stay with it and not get too upset about these periodic crashes, um, you're in a position where you, you've got a, you look, what looks like a solid floor and lots of upside potential. That's a good trade. Again, I'm not a day trader, but uh, you know, timing matters and, and trends matter, and that, that's a good one. So then the question is, what's going to cause gold to break out of the high end of that band and get back to you know, 20, 70 an ounce and, and go further and then make its way to 3,000, 4,000 you know, in, in uh, sooner than later, but not, I'm not saying, you know, next year that soon. The answer is um, it will be a shock, but it will probably be a shock that none of us have on our shock list. And what I mean is um, we kind of, we muddled through a pandemic for the last six months, you know, the worst, um, uh, at least in the U S point of view, uh, the, the, the worst in history, because we now have more fatalities than the Spanish flu. Globally, that's not true. The Spanish flu is still um, number one, but we're talking about the third worst pandemic in the last 650 years. The other two being the Black Death of the 14, mid 14th century, and then of course the Spanish flu of the early 20th century. Um, so that that's a pretty big shock, um, and we've we've had some others. We saw you know the economic we saw major developed economies basically shut down. And that's what happened in, in April of 2020. We basically shut down the store and then, you know, reopened by the third quarter. And uh, we most countries have not made it back to December 2019 levels of output. The United States barely clawed its way back by the end of uh, the second quarter. Um, but, you know, a, a year and a half to get back to where you were, that's extraordinary. I mean, usually you bounce back in three, six months after a recession. Um, and a lot of the world has not yet recovered that. Our, we're still um, at least 5 million, and I think actually more uh, in terms of lost jobs that have not been recovered. I know the unemployment rates now, but that's because people are moving out of the labor force. The labor force participation has dropped. Um, so, um, so there's nothing normal about where we are. You know, it's not the end of the world. We, we muddle through. We carry on, but we're never going to get back to where we were uh, really behaviorally and psychologically. This will be a, a multi-decade inter intergenerational adaptation. But we got through that. Uh, we're, we're making our way through it. Um, so a, the pandemic shock, an economic shock, uh, you know, political shock, uh, if you will, um, um, and, uh, you know, change of leadership in Germany, quite, quite a bit going on. But none of these things has moved the gold price uh, other than, you know, kind of very transient um, moves. So what is it going to be? I, I guess if you use a sort of Bernoulli process, uh, you would say it'll be something. Meaning if you had five, five low probability, let's say you had five events, each of which had a 10% probability. Uh, but you had a three-year frame, three-year time frame. So you say 10%, that's pretty low. Yeah. But if you got five of them, that's 50. And if it's three years, the odds of one of them happening in three years is 100%. So uh, I mean, that's just the math. But my point being, 
I don't know what it will be, and I don't know exactly when, but I feel that we, again, using, using a, a Bernoulli process, I think we can say with high confidence that there'll be something of that magnitude sooner than later, meaning probably, you know, 2022, 2023, that will shake gold out of this um, central tendency and shoot it significantly higher. So I, I agree with a different analysis, but I agree with Kevin's conclusion that this looks like a good, uh, good time to buy.